Well, listen, uh, we're going to talk about a subject that's going to take us a couple of weeks, okay? I'll just let you know that up front. There's no way we'll get it all in this week, and uh, we may or may not get it in all next week. Um, as we go through the book, it, uh, when the game is over, it all goes back in the box by John Ortberg. I'm trying to take it chapter by chapter, but every now and then a chapter just I can't, I can't assimilate it. I can't own it. I, can't, I just can't figure out how to teach it. And so I skipped the chapter, skipped chapter 16 that had to do with competition, and I sent you an email to that effect about what competition has or has not done in your life and um, how competition really and truly can serve to make us better at what we do, especially in the field of athletics, okay? But when you are playing the game of Monopoly like John Ortberg did, where he said he learned all these life lessons as playing with his grandmother, there's a lot of competition, right? And you're competing for things that, while you're caught up in the game, you know, you think they really matter because it's all about what? Winning. It's all about winning, and it's like whoever uh, has the most stuff at the end of the game wins the game. So it talks about competition in Chapter 16 and what that looks like and what that can do for us and to us, okay? But Chapter 17 really gets into something that really, really, really grabbed my attention. And chapter 17 is where we're going to spend a week or two on. And in chapter 17, have you got that up there yet, Don? I want to see that. Chapter 17 is entitled, More Will Never Be Enough. <laughs> More will never be enough. And I want to make it clear up front, I've got about four pages worth of notes that the Lord gave me that I've written down. And we'll get into those. But I want to give you some scripture references too right up, up front because these will be our foundation and basis for exploring the subject of more will never be enough. If you can't see them over there, it's Luke 12, 13 through 21. Luke 12, 13 through 21. And if you remember Luke 12, 13, 21, that's where we started in our study. That's where a man came to Jesus and said, Lord, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. Give me what is due me. And Jesus looked at the man and he said, friend, who made me a judge or a lawyer, an arbitrator over you? And, he, and then Jesus turned to the people around him and said, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. G-R-E-E-D. And when I read that, I thought, well, wait a minute. Who was the greedy one here? Who was the greedy one? Was it the son who wanted what he felt like he was owed? Or was it the son who was holding on to it and who hadn't yet given his brother what he had coming to him? And I thought, my goodness, could be both. It could be both. Uh, and so you can kind of work your way through that mentally and spiritually. But it could be both. They both wanted part of what the other one had. And so this probably wasn't going to have a happy ending. But Jesus said, beware and be on your guard. A double warning. A double warning. Beware and be on your guard of every form of greed. Don's got a slide up here somewhere. We'll see it either now or in a minute. That says something very interesting. It says, none of us want to be materialistic, we just all want more. <laughs> now, now, now just, just, just think about that. We're against materialism as Christians, right? We know that's wrong. We know that's a sin. But we just want more. Just a little more. I'm going to read to you, and then Don will play that clip, but I'm going to read to you something about a guy who thought that more is what he needed. He was uh, written about by a guy named Michael Drosnan. He wrote a book about a man whose name became synonymous with the hunger for more. This man wanted more wealth, so he built one of the greatest financial empires of his day. He wanted more pleasure, so he seduced or paid for the most glamorous women money could buy. He wanted more adventure, so he set airspeed records and designed, built, and piloted the world's most unique aircraft. He wanted more power, 
So he acquired political clout. That was the envy even of senators. He wanted more glamour. So he crashed Hollywood. He owned studios and he courted stars. Michael Drosnan tells how this man's life ended. He was a figure of gothic horror, ready for the grave, emaciated, 120 pounds stretched out over his six foot four inch frame, thin, scraggly beard that reached midway unto his sunken chest, hideously long fingernails and grotesque yellow corkscrews. Many of his teeth were black, writing stumps. A tumor was beginning to emerge from the side of his head. Innumerable needle marks. Howard Hughes was an addict. A billionaire junkie. But here's the question. If Howard Hughes had pulled off one more deal, made one more million, tasted one more thrill, would it have been enough? Because more is never enough. Pray with, pray with me. Lord, we're about to launch into your word about something that we all deal with. Me included, maybe me especially. And we need to know what your word says. And then we need to know what your word means by what it says. And then we need to know what it means to me personally, individually, not just corporately. And Lord, help us to know and understand that just because we don't have more doesn't mean that we're not afflicted with the same addiction, that we want more. And just because we have little or much, this is a sin, this is an addiction, this is a mindset, a lifestyle that is, is entrapment. The myth of more. The myth of more. Lord, I don't want people to leave here feeling like I beat up on them. I know you don't want them to leave, Lord, like feeling like you've beat up on them. We just need to know how. Oh, Lord, to learn to be content. And, Lord, I don't know what that looks like in other people's lives. I, I don't even think that I know what it looks like in my own life. And I struggle with it. I wrestle with it. And ask myself all the time, as you do, how much is enough? How much is enough? So, Lord, I pray that it, this week and next week, you will prick our hearts and pierce our mind with the truth of the Word of God. And that, Lord, your Holy Spirit will take the truth of your Word, drive it home to mine and everybody else's heart, so that we might live lives that represent the kingdom on earth more than our culture that surrounds us. Lord, we ask it in Christ's name for his sake. Amen. Amen. We've got one more little small video clip. Don's a um, uh, classic movie um, buff, and uh, I came across this, and uh, I want you to see this because this kind of says what we're trying to say, and this is a movie called Key Largo, and uh, it's not the whole movie. Just chill out. Um, it's a 32 second clip. I, oh, somebody said, oh, yeah. I know. Oh, Tony, we got to listen to you today. It's a 32 second clip, and it really makes the point and drives it home. Uh, Key Largo has Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, some other stars in it, and they, they uh, kidnap basically this family and hold them for ransom and hostage. And uh, here's the clip from that movie. Okay, go ahead, Don. Well, listen, soldier. Thousands of guys got guns, but there's only one Johnny Rocco. How do you account for it? He knows what he wants, don't you, Rocco? Sure. What's that? Tell him, Rocco. Well, I want, uh, he wants more, don't you, Rocco? Yeah, that's it, more. That's right, I want more. Will you ever get enough? Will you, Rocco? 
Well, I never have. No, I guess I won't. So, uh, to fill in the blanks right here, this is what we're going to think about, okay, for the next couple of weeks. And it's going to mess some of us up, myself included. And part of the reason I think that this is messing with me and stirring my spirit so much is because back when we taught on gratitude, remember we had the, the couple of weeks on gratitude? The Lord impressed on me at that time that one of the things that causes me sometimes to either worry or get anxious or um, distraught about stuff is I, I have a short memory. And I forget to be thankful. And I forget everything that God has brought me through and done in my past. And I forget what he's done, blessed us with in our lives. And I, I, I read in Philippians 4 that says, you know, be anxious for nothing. And I stop right there and I beat myself up because I'm anxious about something, you know. And, but that's not the end of that passage in that truth of Scripture. It's be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And the Lord impressed on me back, I don't know, a month or more ago, Tony, you're not thankful. You're not thankful. You're praying. You, you may be kind of worked up about something, anxious about something. You're, you're, you're exercising supplication. You're having your mind, you're, you're trying to make your mind stay on these things, what are true, pure, honest, just. Um, you know, let your mind dwell on these things. But you're not thankful. And I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And so now, before I go to bed at night, for the last couple of months, and I've got proof of it back here in the back of my book, if you want to look at it, I've started thinking of five things. Five things. You say, well, how'd you come up with the number five? I don't even know. I don't even know. But five things that I'm thankful for that I can attribute to God that he has either done or, watch this, has not allowed to happen in my life, kept me from or brought me to or Things that I just take for granted. How many of you today thank God for the very breath that's in your lungs? It's that kind of basic thing that I'm beginning to understand that I need to be thankful for. How, Ken, you're in here today, okay? I think about you from time to time. I say, here's a man who had his leg amputated, and he's still praising God. He's still thanking the Lord. He's still getting through. He's still getting it done. He's still got a sense of humor. Still got an optimistic outlook. I said, what about me? Have I thanked God that I have two healthy legs? Well, most of the time, I just take it for granted. I just get up and take off. Have I thanked God that my eyes work, that my ears work? I mean, and you may say, Tony, you're getting silly. I don't, I don't think so. I don't, Buzz, I don't, I don't think so. As I get older, I find more reasons to thank God for certain things. Amen? <laughs> certain things at <that> work. <laughs> right? And so, thanksgiving and thankfulness, gratitude, has really, really been a theme in my heart and my life for the last couple of months. So when we come to this scriptural truth here about more will never be enough, it really has hit me right between the eyes. The myth of more leads us to believe that when we get it, fill in the blank, whatever it is for you, that it'll be enough. When we get it, or when we do it, or when we, whatever the it is, that we believe will bring us that lasting satisfaction, when we achieve or accomplish or acquire that, we think then it'll be enough. But it is never enough. There'll always be another it. <laughs> always be another it. A new it. Another it. We, <clears throat> when playing Monopoly using that illustration, 
when we're playing Monopoly, we want more of the board. We want more control. We want to be master of the board. We want more houses, more properties, more hotels, more railroads, more money, which represents control. We don't want to be mere materialistic. We just want more. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. How many of you know who the author of Ecclesiastes is? And don't say Holy Spirit because we all know that, okay? We all know. That's the truth. That is the God honest truth. The Holy Spirit of God is the author of Ecclesiastes. Okay. Now, who did the Holy Spirit of God use? Come on. Talk to me. Do you know anything about Solomon? All right, hold on. Everybody talk at once. What do you know about Solomon? What do you just off the top of your head know? You can shout it out, but... Richest man. What? Wisdom, that's right. Wisdom. Riches. Miserable man. Vanities of vanities. I've read the Ecclesiastes sound like it's a depressing word. I think I've heard that. It can be, can't it? it he, what he says is, is that life apart from God... Yeah, life apart from God is not worth living. It's kind of the summation of the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah. What else? Wisdom, riches, Solomon, what else? You know, Who? Women. Lots of women. It would take, you know, no man in here was willing to go there. You know that, right? I mean, I mean, none of us were going to touch that, Judy. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that out. Yeah, I wasn't going to touch that. I was just going to leave that alone. I was just going to leave that alone. So thank you, Judy, for... Um, remind us of that. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, look at verse 13 with me. Well, let's start in verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. Verse 13, and, and I set my mind. Now, let me tell you, if you don't mind writing in your Bible, if you don't mind underlining or starring or highlighting or something, you need to highlight those words right there. I set my mind. Because we're going to talk a lot about a mindset. We're going to talk about a focus. We're going to talk about priorities. He said, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It's a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. <laughs> Imagine that. And then look over, if you will, in verse um, 16, I mean uh, 17. Again, it says, and I set my mind. And then if you look at chapter 2 and verse 1, now I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. It says, I said to myself. And then verse 4, again, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. Myself, in verse 5, I made gardens and parks for myself. And then if you look at verse 6, I made ponds of water. Now, I like ponds. Now, you understand? Especially if they have fish in them. Amen? But he said, I made ponds of water. What? For myself. And verse 8 again. Also, I collected for myself silver, gold, Treasure of kings, provinces, I provided, same verse, for myself. And then look at verse 11, down about halfway. All was vanity. And striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. Solomon <laughs> was the king of more. He was the king of more. When we buy into the myth of more, we are never completely satisfied. And we live with persistent discontent. When we buy in to the myth of more. 
And Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 and the second part, that was our springboard uh, passage for our whole study where the man asked Jesus to tell his brother to share his inheritance with him and Jesus said, that's not my job, that's not what I came for. Go find yourself a lawyer, go to court. And then he warns them about being greedy. And then he tells a story about a man who the land of a rich man was very productive. By the way, we kind of skipped over that early in our study. If you look at verse 16 of Luke 12, Luke 12, verse 16, it says the land of a rich man was very productive. Now, the guy had to work the land. He had to farm the land. He had to get all that, and he had to do what he could to water it and all that. But how many of you know farmers can do the best they can do and still have a crop that fails? Amen? It happens because it's, 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 it's made better or worse by the what? And how much does, control does the farmer have over the weather? None, okay? And, right, I just died. And, and the bugs and everything else that can eat it up, right? So when Jesus said here, he's making a point. I ran right past it when I, we first started our study. It's the land. It, it, Trish, it was the land was productive. Not the farmer, <laughs> It was the land, not the man. But the man thought, look, man, look what he said in verse 17. He said, man, look, what am I, what am I going to do? I got all this crop and all this harvest and all this food. What am I going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll tear down the barns that I have because they're not big enough. I'll build larger ones. I'll store my grain and everything, and I'll say, man, you have got it made in the shade, brother, for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool, tonight your very soul will be required of you. Then who will enjoy your stuff? And then in verse 21, Luke 12, Jesus said, So is the man who stores up treasure. You ready? Come on. For himself. Or can I say it this way? For herself. And is not rich toward God. So what we're thinking about during this whole study of when the game is over, it all goes back in the box, is what does it look like to be rich toward God? That's what we're looking at. That's what we're trying to analyze. That's what we're trying to own in our own lives is what does it look like to be rich toward God? I told you I think a week or so or more ago that if I, if, if, if I do it for me, it stays on earth and goes in the box with me when I die. If I do it with God for others, that goes on to heaven, and that's how we lay up treasures in heaven. And that is not vanity of vanities. So the man who stores up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. So we're talking about what does it look like to be rich toward God. Um, so, um, oh, let me read this to you right quick. Let me read this to you. You might have already read this, and that's okay. Anybody have something to say? Now's a good time to say it. Do what? My portion. Finally, find out the answer to the question you've been asking here. What is enough? Amen. I am enough. Amen. A study was done comparing what people felt like were needs and wants and what people had and didn't have, and a comparison was made from 1970 versus the year 2000. Now, that's a pretty good gap right there. Was that 30 years? Okay, for those of you good in math. That's 30 years, right? In 1970, 20% of the people said that a need was a second car. Now imagine that. So 80% of the people in 1970 thought having one car was enough. I mean, you're like, look at me like, are you kidding me right now, right? Why do you think they keep making new ones every year? <laughs> because more is never enough. New models. You know, and run all the ads and send us all the stuff. So 
1970, 20% of people said that a second car was a necessity. In the year 2000, now that goes back almost 20 years from now, right? 59% of the people said a second car is definitely a need. So it goes from 20 to 59%, okay, almost triples, right? And I know, look, I know life changes, things, I get all that, I get all that. We're a more mobile society, but I'm just talking about people who said needs versus Wants. Do you ever stop and look back over your shoulder sometimes and say, how did my mom and daddy do it? How did my, how did my grand, really, how did my grand folks do it? Have you ever done that? How did they do it? You, what do you mean they didn't have a dishwasher built in, to, in the house? What? That's, that's abuse. That's human abuse. What do you mean they didn't have a dishwasher in the house? Hey, how many of you remember your daddy telling you the reason that he had you was so you could get up and change the channels? <laughs> Oh, y'all's daddy didn't tell y'all that? <laughs> oh, yeah, Kevin remembers it. Kevin remembers it. That's right. That's right. Hey, my son, my son remembers. Your daddy, did, you had a good daddy. You had a good daddy. My daddy was honest. My daddy was real. My daddy kept it real. He, he's, what did my daddy say? There it is if you like it. There it is if you don't. That's, it. that's exactly right. He said, that's exactly right. He said, hey, get him change that channel, boy, because we had three. Remember? No, you don't know, Carrie. You don't know nothing about this. You don't know nothing about this, girl. Three, five, and 13. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. Most of y'all don't even, huh? Man, you, now hold on now. You go, you're you a little ahead of me now. You're a little ahead of me. Hold on. <laughs> uh, That's right. Come on, Stuart. Oh, wow. In the morning. And they did play the national anthem. Yeah. Man, this is going somewhere, isn't it? <laughs> Judy? Who would have ever thought, Ted Turner, you know, he thought it, that a 24-hour, seven-day news cycle, people would watch it. Whoever. What happens when you want more, and that's Ted Turner. Ted said, Ted said, I got to have a little more. Got to have more. He said, eight hours a day is not enough. It's not enough. Y'all, you don't even know nothing about black and white TV. Come on, tell me. One of her grandsons, years ago, Joseph, who's now 19, if we were watching Andy Griffith, he says, Mama, I don't like those gray shows. <laughs> I don't like those gray shows. I don't like those gray shows, Mimi. Think back again, kind of getting us back on point. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and chapter 2. This is the wisest and the richest man. Per Judy, he had more women than he was supposed to have. And yet, when he looked at all of this stuff, and when he looked at all this more apart from God, he said, it's vanity. It's vanity. It's vanity. In fact, in verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2, verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2, he even goes so far to say, I hated life. What? How could you hate life with everything that you could want or imagine or dream of is at your fingertips. How could you hate life? He said, For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me because everything is utility and striving after wind, and I wrote out my Bible out there without God. He was given a perspective on life that was separate and apart. He said, If you're going to try to satisfy your soul, satisfy your heart, satisfy your life with more, always more, never enough, looking to be completely satisfied with stuff of this world, stuff of this earth, and you're supposed to be a God-fearing, God-following, Christ-honoring person, you're never going to be satisfied, you're never going to be happy with more, because more is never enough. No joy. No joy. No joy. Amen. So, 
3% of the people in 1970 said a second TV was a need. 3%. 3%. Hello? In 2000, 45% said a second TV is a, is a necessity. It's a need. And I'm not getting on anybody, stepping on any toes, but most of us have a TV in almost every room. I've been in hotels that had TV in the bathroom. I'm like, really? And telephones in the bathroom. Really? How about more than one phone? Oh, this don't even go there. This don't even go there. Okay? I, somehow, I, read some, <laughs> ah, I read something in the Reader's Digest. we got to quit. I read something in the Reader's Digest the other day that said, and you know I'm getting old when I read Reader's Digest, right? Like, I love it. I love it. I love it. It's paper. It's paper. I sell paper. Subscribe to Reader's Digest. Everybody in here, everybody in here needs to have a Reader's Digest subscription this coming year. Now, you get that for your spouse, okay? You hear me? Your spouse would like to have that. Your spouse would like to have that, okay? Get your kids on it, okay? So this thing said that they took their young child to work with them, and they said, this happened a few years ago, and said they picked up a phone, and they said, Mama, what is that noise? And the mama said, it was a dial tone. <laughs> this child had never heard a dial tone because we're in a world of cell phones, right? You don't have a dial tone on a cell phone, right? You don't have one. So this child didn't even know what that was, okay? So 2% of the people said more than one phone's a necessity. 2% of them said it in 1970. 78%, almost 80% in the year 2000 said, no, 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 we got to have more than one phone. And then he goes on to air conditioning, dishwashers, and all that. The, the, the thing is, guys, when we look at our, the Scripture, and we're going to keep looking at this. We're going to dig it. i got three more pages of notes here. The deeper problem is that we've kind of bought into an a, a attitude of entitlement. We owe it to ourselves. I deserve it. The deeper problem, which is really discontent, leads to greed. And believe it or not, greed becomes idolatry. I want you to write down Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 through 5. We're going to close with this, but we're going to come back to it. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. I love it to tie in the Old and the New Testament truths, don't you? We can just see that there's a thread sewn all the way through it where it makes sense. And Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and bow your head, but you know whether you've been raised up with Christ or not. You know if you're in Christ or not. If you name the name of Jesus, you say you're a follower of His, you've been raised up with Him, here's some instruction. Keep seeking. Now notice, that is present perfect tense. Y'all didn't know I knew that, I know. Present perfect tense. It's something that happens now, but it continues to happen in the future and it goes on. you got to keep doing it, in other words. You need to keep doing it. Don't stop. Keep seeking what? Things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, I love this. Listen, this is I highlighted this in pink. It's so hot to me. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, verse 5, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Now watch the list. list watch the list. Dead to immorality, impurity, passion. And that word there really means lust. Okay, that's a desire that's gone overboard. Evil desire and, what's the next word? Greed, which does what? Amounts to idolatry. I don't know if you ever thought about greed and the myth of more and wanting more, seeking more, grasping for more. 
don't know if you ever thought about it, but it can quickly devolve into greed and into idolatry. I'm going to close with this. Could it be we try to satisfy a spiritual hunger with physical and temporal things? Could it be that we try to satisfy a spiritual hunger with physical and temporal things? Could it be? Will somebody close us in prayer?